Pharisee of Jesus, the worse it becomes. Okay? I get more hungry and more thirsty for Jesus. When I look into his eyes, ha <laughs> ha man! Create the most wonderful atmosphere that you start living in the cloud of God. You start living in the cloud of God's glory. You no longer get into meetings and out of meetings, and into prayer sessions and out of prayer sessions, but you enter a realm. <laughs> Sorry guys, I'm getting blasted here. You, you enter a realm of glory where you walk with Him in the cloud. And where you are saturated with His life and the presence of Jesus becomes a radiant glowing light through your life. Wherever you move, the presence moves with you. Don't you think that that was the ultimate purpose of the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Don't you think that was God's grand design? Don't you think that's why Jesus came? He came that we would become one with God, one with the Spirit, that the Holy Spirit would control us, that we would, be, that we would carry the character, the nature, the imprint of who God is. And that that would be reflected through our lives wherever we go. He came to crucify the flesh. He came to kill everything that's angry inside of you. Every bit of anger, every bit of resentment, every bit of rebellion that lived in the flesh, in carnality. He came to destroy that in you. So that the beauty of all who He is might become a living part of who you are. That you may become a carrier of His nature, His glory, His presence, His anointing. And wherever you go, that anointing is released through your life. Touches people's lives. Isn't it so wonderful to serve this Jesus? What a glorious and a wonderful experience to be a part of His life. That's what the cross came for. It's not about your salvation only. That your salvation is a result of the cross. But the life God had planned for you to become a part of was His grand design. He wanted to reconcile you. He wanted to bring you back into Eden. He wanted to bring you back into walking in His presence in a great revelation of who He is that once again His Spirit will be your Spirit. And the two of you will become one, married. And in that harmony, your life will become His life. And you'll be involved in every aspect, in every area of your life. That's why the anointing doesn't just affect you spiritually. When you're in a meeting like this, when the anointing comes into your life, it will affect every area of your life. Everything that you touch will explode because of God's presence. Every area of your life is affected. But then you must be in the place where you've given God the authority in every area of your life. You understand? You've got to allow the Spirit of God then to reign in every area. In other words, your business is no longer your business. It's God's business. Your decisions are no longer your decisions. It's a leading of the Spirit in your life, in every area. And when you live there, I tell you something, wherever you move and whatever you do, the anointing of God will cause it to prosper and to explode. You see that? That was God's grand design. He wanted to free us from everything that would restrict us from the best that He had for us. Eden was the perfect environment. It was the glory dome of heaven. It was heaven on earth. And that's God's grand design for you and me. That you and I would come into the place. <coughs> and we so twisted things and got it all wrong. And even in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, most people don't understand what it's about. It's not about signs, wonders and miracles. It's not about that. The disciples were doing signs, wonders and miracles before they got into the upper room. 
They were performing miracles. They were casting out devils long before they got into the upper room. It hasn't got anything to do with that. It's got to do with the fact that Jesus said, you can't remain the same as you are. Peter, you can't stay who you are because you're failing me and you will continue failing me. Something needs to change in you. My spirit and your spirit need to become one. My father's character needs to be your character, Peter. You need to be transformed. Go up to Jerusalem. Wait in the upper room because something amazing is going to happen. The promise I made through my prophet Joel 4,000 years before. What was that promise? Joel saw something that no man ever seen in his life before. And when he spoke it to the ears of the people, they couldn't even begin to understand what he was talking about because he prophesied that a day will come when man and God will once again be one. That's what he prophesied. He said a day will come when God will pour his spirit out upon his people and they'll be so one that God's word will be their words. They'll prophesy. They'll speak forth the word of God. Their ears will be God's ears. They'll be able to hear God. God's dreams will be, become their dreams. God's eyes will become their eyes. They'll come into a place of complete union. Back then, those were amazing words to hear because nothing like that existed. People lived under the law. There was no experience of God, no intimacy with God. So th these were marvelous words. And Jesus says, go and wait. Because that promise is going to come. You are going to become one with my Father. Everything will change. That was the purpose of the upper room. That was the purpose of the upper room. The presence of God and the power of God needed to become one in them. They already operated in the power of God. Because operation in the power of God, your, your, uh, your purpose in life, your, your ministry will put a demand on God's power. Do you understand that? Your ministry will put a demand on God's power. In other words, if God called you for something, He's going to anoint you for it. He's going to empower you. He calls the disciples. He gives them authority. Go out. He puts some power in them and some authority upon them and sends them. But yet these miracle working disciples, yet these three year old students that got a download from heaven like nobody else ever did in history, Yet these people that walked with Christ Himself, yet these people that cast out demons still needed to go to the upper room. Why? They already had the power. They didn't have the presence. And the power without the presence is very dangerous because you'll find the power working in total carnality. You'll find people that don't have the presence and have the power being sometimes most of the most prideful people on the face of the planet because their gift and made them proud. Their name needs to be blasted up everywhere and everybody needs to call them by the highest title possible and everybody's got to walk circles around them because they've got a gift operating. No. When you've got the presence... <laughs> It will melt you and bring you into the place of being a servant unto all men. It will change you to become like Jesus. It will change your character. It will change your nature. It will merge you with all of God so that when you walk into a place, people will meet Jesus, not you. They will not meet Mr. Important. They will meet the presence of Jesus. And they will be changed because of that. And Jesus didn't want power without presence. He said, go, something's going to happen. You're going to change. And they did. When God breathed upon them, I believe that's what happened. I believe it was Genesis reenacted. See, God breathed on Adam and the Spirit of God came into him and became a living being. I believe the wind they heard in that upper room was the breath of God breathed in from heaven. And they were all filled with the Spirit, the nature, the character of God and the Tongues of fire evidently started appearing on them. They were changed. They, they were not the same people. Acts tells us the story. It tells us the story of a supernatural people. It tells us of people doing things out of the natural realm into the supernatural. Things that ordinary people don't do. Ordinary people don't go and sell their homes. 
and sell everything they have and, and, and just bring it to the feet of Jesus and say, I've got no interest in this stuff anymore. I'm living in heaven. Ordinary people don't do that. Ordinary people fight for what they have. But when you're in the Spirit, and when the Spirit of God changes your heart, suddenly it's not about me and myself and my stuff anymore. All of a sudden, it's all about Jesus. And the reason they sold that stuff was not to enrich the church. Why did they sell it? So that every one of them would be equally cared for. All of a sudden, the love of God pours out of me. For my brother and my sister, I'm saying, what well, I've got, you've got to have, man. If I'm eating, you've got to eat. If I'm sleeping, you've got to sleep. All of a sudden, Jesus comes on the scene. It tells me the story of a supernatural people changed. Something happened. God came into the selfish nature of man and destroyed it. Salvation opens the door. Salvation prepares the house. Salvation brings you into a place where you say, Jesus, come and live inside of me. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit, God comes and He occupies the house and He dresses the house in the finest finishes. And the glory of God is made manifest in your life. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. Jesus is wonderful. Amen. We're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. We started, we've been talking about the anointing for quite a long time now. And now we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Or you can say the fruit of the anointing. Or you can say the fruit. Sorry, this is just for me. If you can't read this, don't worry. I, I understand what I did here. Or you can say, the fruit of the life of God, because it's all the same thing. The fruit of the Spirit is the fruit of the life of God in you. Can you see that? Do you realize that if, this, if you fall with the Spirit of God, you're filled with God's own life. So the fruit of the Spirit will be the fruit that God's life will bear through your life. Can you see that? The anointing is the resident manifested life of God through you. It's not something, it's not some, it's Jesus. It's the manifest Spirit of God inside of you, working in you firstly and secondly working through you. But it's Jesus, the Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of the Father, the Holy Spirit inside of you. It's the anointing. The anointing is not something you receive if somebody throws a jacket on you. The anointing is Christ in you. It's Christ in you. And He manifests through you. That's why relationship is everything in God. People are chasing signs, wonders and miracles. If you find Christ, you've got signs, wonders and miracles that will follow you. You don't need to chase it. You just need to surrender to Christ. Amen? Amen. Somebody once said, uh, we need another great awakening. And the, the Holy Spirit said to me, no, 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 that's not what you need. You don't need another great awakening. You need a Christ awakening. Christ needs to become the center of everything we are and everything we do. And if we can rediscover Christ and His presence in us and in our ministries and in everything, we can find the living presence of Jesus, then we will have another great awakening. Then we'll have another. The problem is we're chasing the awakening, not the presence of Jesus. You see? All right, so we're talking about fruit, and we say that fruit, in order to have fruit, you need to have plant. <laughs> let, me, let me get my English straight, I'm crossing my words here now. For fruit to exist, seed needed to have been planted somewhere. Fruit cannot exist by itself. Fruit is the result of seed sown. So when I look at somebody's fruit, it will tell me what seed has been sown in it. Is that right? If I look at fruit, then I'll know what seed lives inside of them because whatever seed's been sown will produce the fruit. So we're talking about the fruit of the life of God in you. What will God's life produce inside of you? Okay, let's go to Romans 8 quickly if you've got your Bible here. We started touching on the subject the last time we got together. I don't know if we're going to get through all of this. We'll go as the Spirit goes. Um, Romans chapter 8 <clears throat> we started talking about 
the law of God, the law of the Spirit of God, the law of the Spirit of life. Now, I've got the Amplified here. So if yours don't read the same, just listen. Because this breaks it open very nicely. <clears throat> Let me read it to you. It says in verse 1, Therefore there is now no condemnation, no adjudging guilt or wrong for those who are in Christ Jesus. That word in is immense. One of the most important words in that entire verse is that word in. It's not outside of Christ. It's in Christ. In other words, in relationship with Christ. In oneness with Christ. Rooted in Christ. He says there's no more condemnation for those who are in Christ. Very important. Because if you're not in Christ, you can't claim this. If you're not in a living relationship with Christ, if Christ is not really, you're not in Him and He's not in you. You're just walking by His name, but you're living like a hooligan, you can't claim this. You can only claim this in Christ. Okay? He says, There's no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who live and walk not after the dictates of the flesh, but after the dictates of the Spirit. Now listen, verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life. I want you to mark that as law number one. Law number one, he mentions here is the law of the spirit of life. Which is again, where? In Christ Jesus. Alright? And then the Amplified breaks it up a little further. It says, the law of our new being. That's beautiful. The law of our new being. In other words, the law governing our new being. Alright? Alright? has freed me, here's law number two, from the law of sin and of death. Paul talks of two laws here. The first law, he says, is the law of God's own life governing your life. He calls it a law. He says, there's a law that can live inside of you, which is the very life of God Himself, that comes to live inside of you and it becomes your law. He says that law has freed me from the law of sin and death. In other words, he says there's two places to live here. If you're living in the realm of where, where sin and death reigns over your life. In other words, if you're outside of Christ. Now this applies on many levels. We think of sinners outside of Christ. Let me tell you there's many Christians living outside of Christ. Because to be in Christ means to be in a relationship with Jesus. It's what he talks of in John 15. He says, you're a part of me, I'm a part of you. He says, my life flows through you. And we connect it and the fruit hanging from you is fruit of my own presence produced through your life. That's what it means to be in Christ. So now, he says, there's two places to live here. He says, the one place you live in the Spirit, and if you live in the Spirit, the very life of God has become the law governing your life. He says that frees you from the previous law, which is the Ten Commandments, the Ten Rules that God wrote down. He says this law will free you from that law that, that is meant for people who are living outside of Christ. You see, if you live outside of Christ, you're living in the domain where sin and death rules. If you're living in that domain, there's ten rules for you that God gave you to keep amongst others, but there's ten main rules that God gave you to keep. And if you keep those ten rules, living in that domain, those ten rules will protect you. Okay? Paul says, something wonderful happened. He said, Jesus came. He says, a new law came into operation in my life, which is greater than those ten rules. He says, God Himself, in all of His life, became my law. Wow! God Himself, Greater than those ten things because those ten things came out of him. Alright? So how can the ten how can we even compare if I give you ten rules to keep and you keep those ten rules and all of a sudden I come in with all who I am and come and live inside of you and say, Now I'll be your law. In other words, I will lead you, I will guide you. I will be the new law in you. And as I lead you, so your life will be ordered by my spirit. A new government has come into my life. That's what Paul says. He says, I'm now governed by the very life of God himself. That's awesome. 
That's awesome. Are you with me? Do you get this? Two laws. Now, there are three places for every person on earth to live. Three laws under which you live. Either you're governed by the Spirit of God, and He's your law. This is what the Bible says. Secondly, you're governed by the Spirit of... Uh, what did we say? Sin and death. The law of sin and death. Or thirdly, you're lawless. In other words, you're not standing under any authority of God. Do you know how many Christians live there? Do you know how many Christians believe that they can do whatever they want to do? They don't have to regard God's word. They don't have to be governed by the Holy Spirit. They can live like hell. And they still go into heaven because they believe God gave them a free license to do so. Let me tell you, if you live there, the Bible calls you lawless. I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to show it to you. We'll get to it later. If you're not governed by the Spirit of God, God says, you are lawless. You see, we can't live in a place where we are lawless. The new law of God's life came to exceed anything He ever gave to us as the Ten Commandments. Here Paul says that to you. He says, there's a new law, a new government in me. It's not a few rules. It's the very living presence of God Himself that's come inside of me. And that's now guiding me and leading me and expressing Himself through me. Amen? Now, what's very important to understand is, and I want to give you these few points because there's so much rhetoric about this. Let me just give you this. Number one, God is perfect. Do you agree with me that God is absolutely perfect? If you need scriptures for that, go read Psalm 18 verse 30 and read Psalm 19 verse 7. God is perfect in all of His ways. And Psalm 19 verse 7 will tell you that the law of God is perfect. This is really important to know because a lot of people are attacking the law of God. If you attack the law of God, you're attacking God. If you're attacking the law of God, you're attacking God because where did the law come from? Do you realize that Moses didn't even write the law? God, with his own finger, engraved those laws into stone tablets and gave them to Moses. And Moses carried it off the mountain, glowing with his presence, so that everybody would know, this is from God. Can you see that? So the law, you can never attack, you can never diminish it. It came out of God. All things that come out of God is perfect. The problem was where the law came to was not perfect and that's you and me the law came to an imperfect place perfection came to imperfection now let's just carry reading on what this says verse 3 says for God has done uh, for God has done what the law could not do listen to this this is freaking amazing sorry for my plot laws now but it really is amazing it says God has done what the law could not do. In other words, when God arrived in your life, He came to do what no outer law could do for you. Why? It says, because the law was being weakened by the flesh. What is the flesh? The entire nature of man without the Holy Spirit. In other words, man not governed by God. Man in the flesh. Man living under that realm of sin and death, reigning over him, disobedient to God. He says, God came to do this, what the law could not do, sending his own son in the guise of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, God condemned in the flesh, the sin in the flesh, subdued, overcame, and deprived it of its power over all who would accept that sacrifice. Can I explain that to you? It's so beautiful. It says that this realm of sin and death reigned over you. Man, you know what? In actual fact, a sinner has got no choice but to sin. Do you know that? As a sinner, you've got no choice. You've got no, you can't choose not to sin. You're just going to sin, brother. You are bound. You are in a place where there's an authority and a realm that's got charge over you, which is going to cause you to sin whether you like it or you don't like it. And Paul tells you about that in Romans chapter 7. He says, the things I don't want to do, because there's many religious people that really want to live a good life for Jesus Christ, and they keep knocking their toes against every stone along the way, because the things that they don't want to do, they end up doing. And the things they really want to do, they don't do. 
You see, when that realm reigns over you, you've got no choice, you've got no power to choose differently. You are controlled. You're a puppet. You're born into this authority that's over your life. Now God says, Jesus came to demolish that power over your life. If you accept this sacrifice of Him, He says, that dark cloud over your life is demolished, it's it's torn into two and the light of God comes in and the presence of God comes in and He does what the law couldn't do. It says so that, verse 4, so that the righteousness and the just requirements of the law might be free making us who live and move not in the ways of the flesh but in the ways of the spirit. Our lives governed not by the standard and according to the dictates of the flesh, but controlled by the Holy Spirit. Can you see in that verse, verse what happened? Can you see that? He says, the law has certain requirements. He says, but the life of God that came into us met all of those requirements. Can you see that? In other words, there were rules. That was a clump of reals. Geweest. Maar God sy teenwoordigheid in my, as groter as die reals, en skielik het God sy teenwoordigheid in my, baie meer geword as al die reals, en teendeel, sy teenwoordigheid in my, het my gerechte gemaakt, want nou leef hy in my in sy volheid, en hy rug my in sy gees, en in sy voetstappe. Ek is een nieuwe skepsel, ek is onder een nieuwe regering, die lewe van God in my, het beheer gevat oor my lewe, en daarom het die gerechtigheid van God nou in my gekom. Ek hoef nie reels te volg nie, God leef in my. He? Is that beautiful? Right. Now, let's get back to this. Do you agree with me that the law is perfect? Do you agree with me that there was nothing wrong with the law of God? Who was the wrong, who was the wrong party? Why could the law not do its job? The law could not do its job because of us. Because we were rebellious, because we kept failing. God gave us this perfect thing, but we couldn't live up to it. So He did something new. But what He gave us was perfect. Okay? It was perfect. There's nothing wrong with it. It came out of Him. Alright. Now, the second thing that's important is to understand that there's perfect harmony between God's grace and God's law. Many people today try and put the law of God and the grace of God at war with each other. God is not at war with Himself. The grace came out of God, and so did the law come out of God. God has got nothing to repent of. Brother, God's never going to say He's sorry that He gave those, 12, uh, those 10 rules. He's never going to say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, I should have never gotten that, and I fixed the mistake now on Calvary, I changed my mind, I'm sorry guys, I was wrong, let me fix it all for you. No, 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 no. The cross did not come to change God, because God didn't need to change the cross, grace came to change us so that we may become as He is. In other words, the law of God and the grace of God are married. Because we couldn't keep to this, the grace of God came to work with the law of God in harmony to rescue us and to do a marvelous work inside of us. Do you know where you can find that? You can find it in Jeremiah uh, chapter 33, uh, chapter 31, verse 33. It says that God makes a promise. He says, the day is coming, I'm going to make a new covenant with you. He says, I will take my law and I will write it on the table of your heart. He says, I will take my spirit and put it inside of you. Isn't that beautiful? A new covenant I will make with you. So what happens? God, by His grace, comes to you, brother. He says, listen, you, you're never going to make it. I've given you this ten perfect things that came out of me. But you are living under a domain where I see you keep failing them. And I want to save you. I created you for my presence. So what does he do? He sends Jesus and he plants a cross and Jesus demolishes. He becomes the offering for your sin. He demolishes that stronghold over you. And God says, listen, my law and my grace is going to meet you. By grace, I'm bringing you into the standard of my law. By grace, I'm bringing you. But this law is not ten rules. This law is my very presence inside of you. That's going to change you to be righteous as I am. And that's going to start leading you along my ways. 
Can you see that? Does it make sense? Right. Let me move away from this a little bit. Let's look at the fruit of the Spirit now. If you want to, you can check it out. Otherwise, stay with me. We're going to Galatians chapter 5. That's where it speaks of the Spirit of the Lord. And His fruit. Now, I want to lift out one verse. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Chapter 5, verse 18 says this simple statement. It says, But if you are guided and led by the Holy Spirit, you are not subject to the law. I want to prove what I'm saying to you out of the Bible, that you see this is not fibs. The Word of God says, But if you are guided and led by the Holy Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now he's talking about those Ten Commandments. Why is he saying that? Let's find out. Verse 22 says, But the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the work which His presence within accomplishes, is love, joy, gladness, peace, patience, and ever temper, forbearance, kindness, goodness, benevolence, faithfulness. There's a list that's never ending because it's describing the character of God. So we can carry on with that list. Goodness, mercy. All that God is, we can fit in here. He's taking just a few of them to, 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 to show you what the Holy Spirit will start doing inside of you, what it will produce in you. Now listen, he says, gentleness, meekness, humility, self-control, self-restraint, continence, uh, continence, against, now listen, against such things, there is no law that can bring a charge. Do you hear this? Paul says, if the Spirit of God lives in you, what law is going to be against you? What law can be greater than God's presence inside of you? What am I trying to tell you tonight? What is this all about? I want you to understand that you are living under a law. You tonight cannot be lawless. I cannot be lawless. We are living under a law. But the law that we live under is the beautiful presence of Jesus inside of our life that's come to free us and rescue us and carry us into the glory of God. Your life should produce God wherever you go. The Holy Spirit came for this reason that God would become the one living and moving inside of you. That your whole life will bear the fruit of His life in your life. Can you see that? Now, how does that happen and where does that happen? Today, it's very, it's, it, I think, much harder for us than it was in the old days. Because in the old days they understood what happened when the baptism of the Holy Spirit came. Today we don't. We say to people, listen, you've got to be baptized in the Spirit. You know, the Bible says, you must now, you say now, we must get you into water, and we must get, lay hands on you, and you must be baptized with the Holy Spirit, and then you're going to speak in tongues, and you're going to have power. That's what we proclaim the baptism of the Holy Spirit to be. It's not. It's a transference of God's character and nature in yours. People should understand when they are full of the Spirit, my God, everything in your life comes under God's control and you look like those in the upper room. Wherever you go, brother, I tell you, the glory of God is you are a completely changed person inside out. It's not about the miracles that you perform. It's about Christ in you and manifesting through you. Because that message is no longer preached, people don't understand what happens to them. And now we need a long journey with God. We have the Spirit and the flesh competing in people. They want to walk in the Spirit, but they keep falling in the flesh. And it's a whole long journey and a whole long battle to resist the flesh and to resist all of this. And God's got to free you of all of these different things in your life. It's a long process now. Because we didn't get it right at the beginning. So if you minister to somebody at some point in time, explain to them what's going to happen so that they can receive an impartation from heaven. They will change them. Teach them that God lives inside of them now. Bring them on the right journey from the very word go so they understand now it's me and Jesus on a new journey together. And it will uncomplicate a lot of things. Tonight in this place, there's people that want to be where I'm talking about, but that aren't there in this place. 
There's people that say, I so long to be like that. I so long for God's presence to just be everything inside of me and wherever I go. But you're not there because you constantly, you, you're between two worlds. You, you, then you're in the flesh and then you're in the spirit. And then you're in the flesh and then you're in the spirit. And you bet, battle to get the two together. In this place, I'm telling you, I know. I know. And it's not shameful, it's the reality. We have to get to a place to change. If we want to walk in the glory, we've got to be able to change. And the thing that will keep you tonight is your pride. <laughs> it will be your pride. And pride is a fruit of the, of the flesh, not of the spirit. It means that if there's pride in you tonight, you've got to realize this was, there's still a boulder for God to move. There's still a boulder in me for God to move because that's not who the Father is. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we all want to get to that glory. How do we do it? We do it by willingly coming to a place of full surrender in our lives. And I explained it to you earlier. You've got to put God in the position where He governs your life completely. You've got to make a choice to commit your life to God. You've got to make a choice to, keep, to place Him in charge of your life and say, Father, I give myself fully to You. I want You to come, Holy Spirit, and govern my entire life. Every area of my life. I don't want to move without your, your okay. And you know what? God will meet you there if you're ready to go there. If you are ready to go there, God will meet you there. But this is the only way you will ever walk in the Spirit. Is by making that choice and saying, Father, I give you my entire life. I come to you and I give you my life. Not to do something for you. Not to be successful at something. Just to surrender in service to you. Here's my life. Come and make me. Mold me into exactly what you had destined for me. Make me. I want a relationship with you. I want your presence in me. I want to love you. I want to marry you. I want my, to give myself entirely to your will and to your purpose and to your destiny in my life. It's not about me anymore. It's all about you. I put everything out in my life, everything else, everything that's precious to me, I put under your government and I want you to lead me and to instruct me. Whatever you ask me to do, I'll do. Wherever you send me to go, I'll go. Whatever you ask me to lay down, I will lay down. That's the only place of coming to a place where you allow the Spirit of God to come into government in your life and where you truly come to a place of surrendering to God and experiencing His fullness in your life. When you come there, the Holy Spirit will begin working with you. Will be working inside of you. A lot of stuff that still lives in you will come out. God will bring it out. Sometimes He will bring it out through situations or through people that He brings into your life. People that will offend you so that anger can jump out of your life. So that the Holy Spirit can identify and you say, Oh God, free me from the Spirit of anger. Or, or somebody will come and, and, and situations will come and will put you under pressure and God will again lift out of you what needs to go and will set you free from those things until at the end of the day all that will be seen in you is the glory of Jesus. All that will live in you is the glory of Jesus. All of the flesh will be demolished. You see, the flesh is built up in us. The day you get saved, it's a clean break. It's the purest day that you'll ever see in your entire life on earth. It's the day that you meet Jesus Christ. If you are genuinely born again, it's the purest day in your life. It's the day where you're absolutely pure of all sin. You are, you've got heaven inside of you. All things are new. It's the purest moment. It's like a baby being born. The moment that baby comes out, he's the purest little thing that ever enters the atmosphere of this world. Unpolluted, untouched, pure, holy, beautiful. When you are born again, that's the moment for you. The sin in us, the, the, the flesh in us, our self will start growing in us again from that moment on, on unless we submit our lives fully to God right there. That's why you'll find when people were saved in the Bible, they were put into water immediately and hands were laid on them and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Because God immediately took government over their life. And they understood now the journey with Jesus. And they immediately had the power of God 
to be witnesses. Do you know what that word witnesses means? Just as a matter of interest, the word used there, witnesses, do you know what it means? In the original language, if you look at that word witnesses, it's the word matais. It's where we get the word martyr from. So Jesus is saying, He says, you'll receive power to be martyrs unto me. Witnesses to be through martyrdom. What does it mean? Does it mean everybody's head is going to get chopped off? No, it means, He's saying, the moment the Spirit of God comes in you, you're going to lay your life down. In surrender. The old man's going to die. You're going to martyr that old life. The old you is going to the grave so that you can become a true witness filled with my life. You're going to destroy that old life of yours. You're going to lay it down willingly. I'm not going to force you, but you are going to say, Jesus, I lay that old life down for me with your presence. Empower me with who you are, your character, your nature, your personality. Come live through me. You see that? Is that beautiful? <coughs> In your life, right where you are tonight, irrespective of what has come, because it's with all of us, it's the same, brother. This, this stuff to me, I'm saying, oh my God. It's like that for the It's like that for the other. And I was happy that the Lord It never was about ministry. It's still not about ministry today. I love sharing with you guys. I'm not seeing this as ministry. At all, I'm not. I'm not. I don't, I don't even looking at it that way. Actually, I'm not going three hours part, three hours part, four thousand hours part. Yeah, I can only see what is coming. It's been able to impart this into somebody and share with them and say, "My God, there's such a beauty in Christ that can be in you." That's all. I'm witnessing. I'm witnessing to people. I'm witnessing to you. I'm imparting into you. I'm imparting into you. I'm telling you things that God put in me that can work in you. That's what it's about. It's, I don't care about being in ministry. I'm, no. I love this. It's great. It's wonderful. There's a, there's, a, there's a vibrance in the air. When we're sitting here, we're feeling the presence of We know Jesus is here. Things are happening. We're feeling Him in the Word. We, it's great. So, right where you are, Things can change for you from tonight. You just need to put God in full government of your life. And that's sometimes the hardest thing for people to do. If they've been saved for 10 years and they set in their ways and now they've got to change everything. But you see, God's program with us is change. His program with us is to change us. He says you need to change from glory to glory. He says, as you look into me, you're looking into a mirror. As you see me, as you see more of me, as more of my revelation is released in your life, he says, what you see is reflected back into you. And as it's reflected into you, you become what you see. You changed into the glory that you behold. So that's levels of glory. Because as the revelation comes, I'm going to change you from one level of glory into the next level of glory. And you're going to become more and more glorious in my spirit. Mm -hmm. Where you are tonight, God is asking for one thing. He's asking for what He asked for the day He saved you. A full surrender. He's saying, let's start where we should have started. Give me everything in your life. Not your heart. Not your commitment. Give me your life. Surrender all to me. Give everything to me. And allow me from tonight to come by my spirit and to become a law of the spirit of my life in your life. Let me govern you in my ways. And if you can do that tonight, I promise you, you're going to start experiencing the glory of God in your life like never before. And you will start seeing fruit in your life. The fruit of his life and His presence in you will start changing things around your life, your circumstances. Everything will be affected because you are affected. Because it's changing you. Amen? Let's close our eyes tonight. Wonderful Jesus, You are so beautiful. You are so holy. You are so precious. You did it all for us. 
on Calvary, what we could not do, what we could never dream of, the gift that you gave us. To be able to partake and be partakers of your life. To be a part, a living part of your presence. That gift goes beyond anything we could ever imagine. It's more valuable than anything we could ever imagine. And you paid with your blood. You did not keep anything back. The word says, for the joy that was set before you, for the joy of, of seeing us tonight, for the joy of seeing the Father's heart glowing with love and radiating with joy as people come and as people, His children, are reunited with Him. For that joy that was set before you, you endured more than most people would be willing to endure even for themselves, let alone for somebody else that they don't even know. In your manhood, you felt the blows of every nail. It didn't escape you. You didn't have some supernatural way of, of not hurting and of not being human. You felt the piercing blows. You, you had to live, Lord, in the place of humbling yourself when you were spat in the face and, and beaten with fists and cursed and ridiculed and mocked. You had to humble yourself to that, to receive that on our behalf. You were spotless. You were spotless. But you did it for us tonight so that we may come and share in your glory. Share in the oneness of the Father. How precious that is, Jesus. How much you love us and how much you desire for us to walk in the newness of your life. Tonight in this place, we want to surrender our lives. If you agree with me tonight, if you say tonight, yes, and you must mean it from your heart, if you want to say with me, yes, yes, I'm going to lift my hands because this is the prayer of my heart. I'm asking if you want to be included. And if you say, Lord, here's my everything from tonight, that I mean it with all of my life. I believe tonight I'm entering a new phase. A new phase where I'm going to walk with you in places I've never been. And I'm prepared to go with you and I want to be changed. If that's your prayer with me tonight, just lift your hands. Just lift them up. I'm not even looking. I don't care if your hand is up or down. I don't care. This is my prayer. You can make it yours tonight. Father, we want to say without restriction and without restraint, here we are. Forgive us for all of the mistakes that we've made, Lord. In our ignorance, where we've missed you, where we've missed the mark, and we didn't understand, we didn't know. Thank you for grace upon grace upon grace tonight that you come to us once again and say, all I want from you is a surrender. I want your permission. I want you to open your heart and your life and allow me to rule and to reign inside of you. I want to allow you, me, you to allow me to fill you like you've never been filled. I want to be my presence and my life in you that you will bear much fruit. I thank you tonight for every person in this place that's responding, that's saying, here I am, Jesus. Just change me. Just come into me tonight and do something new in me. Put your spirit in me, Lord. Revive me, refresh me. Breathe in me as you did on those first 120 disciples. Affect my life in a real way, in a tangible way where I'll experience you and see the fruit of your life. I love you tonight and I give myself unconditionally to you. In these moments the Holy Spirit is here and is receiving that prayer from your heart right now. He's receiving that prayer from your heart right now. He's in this place, the power, the presence you feel.